Dr. Gare Evanson. He's an applied mathematician with a PhD from the University Give me a second. Uh, with more than 30 years of experience in research and development related to data assimilation in ocean, ocean and weather forecasting and petroleum technology. Today, uh, Dr. Evanson will present to us his research on and uh, its title on International Initiative on Predicting the SARS-CoV-2 Pandemic Using Ensemble Data Assimilation. Okay, so at this time, I'll give the microphone to the speaker and the speaker will go ahead and present. Okay, so thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, uh, this, uh, this, this is uh, work that came out of kind of nowhere because uh, it started in March when uh, I ended up at home in a home office in quarantine and uh, the whole world was going crazy in a way. Um, also, what we, we saw then was that uh, we didn't really know the severity of the virus. We didn't know how it would develop. We received a lot of uh, information or inconsistent information from the government and from uh, authorities. And uh, with my background in more in dynamical systems, mathematics, uh, at least I had some strong opinions or I believe I had my own understanding of how severe the virus would be in terms of uh, exponential growth and uh, which was one of the things the politicians didn't understand that if you have some unstable system then it there is a danger it will really explode and go exponential very quickly so it's a really unstable system and uh, also, the virus seemed to be quite severe when, uh, based on reports we got from Italy and, uh, and China as well. So at that time, I decided to see if I could do something myself, and I implemented uh, uh, an epidemic model, a so-called SER model, and I coupled it to a data simulation system and started gathering what they could have of uh, data on hospitalizations and deaths, etc. in Norway. And then very quickly we were able to tune the model to and, and predict the developments of the pandemic in Norway. And uh, we did this then in collaboration with uh, the Norwegian authorities. So I was uh, doing case studies, scenario studies, and delivering reports to the authorities and, uh, and, and try to educate them in, uh, in what we could expect uh, from the pandemi pandemic, uh, given different uh, ways of trying to handle it or implement interventions, etc. So at some point, uh, we had the model system running. We were quite happy with what we got. And then I contacted a number of collaborators internationally because I thought that, okay, what I built was quite easy to use and quite flexible. And uh, I, I, well, there's a big data simulation community that understood the models and uh, are good mathematicians. So we ended up with having the system running in uh, yeah, several countries in Europe, uh, in the US, in South America, for a couple of countries there in Canada. And, uh, and in the end, we, continue the development of the system and uh, we kind of try to predict the evolution of the pandemic in the different countries and we also communicate had interaction with authorities and try to to contribute to the the situation and uh, so this ended up as a publication it's a, there's a version of the paper on the med archive it was submitted in june uh, now there is a revised version, which uh, the, the previous version was quite extensive. It's like 53 journal pages and uh, the revised version is 73, I think. So it's a, it's a quite a large uh, publication and uh, uh, hopefully it will appear quite soon now. So we called it, the title of the paper was an international initiative for predicting the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic using ensemble data simulation. And the idea was a bit to explain both how, how you could model the pandemic, 
uh, how, explain how important it is to kind of kill the virus and, and kind of, yeah, stop the pandemic uh, before, uh, while you still have a possibility of doing that. And then how to explain, explain how to use uh, ensemble data simulation methods for calibrating the models. And uh, yeah, so, and that's what I will talk about today. So in my presentation, I will talk a bit about the data simulation methods we have used, and then I will show some examples from, uh, from the paper. Um, okay, so I just uh, update, the, I made three slides today, just to show you the global development of the uh, COVID pandemic. And so this is the total number of deaths uh, globally up till today. And you see that we have more than, yeah, we assume 1.2, million deaths globally. If you look at the daily deaths, it seems to have stabilized, like it's about the same number of deaths on a weekly basis, um, except that if you see at the end here, there is a slight increase. We had something similar in, in July, end of July, August, but uh, still it looks quite stable right now. So it is kind of, there's a linear behavior it seems in, in these plots. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the daily new cases, uh, we also see here that in, during the summer it was quite stable, but now in the last few weeks, there has been a strong increase. And this is, I think, exponential. Uh, if you look at the active number of cases globally, there's also, uh, it seems like there is a strong increase or maybe exponential increase. and. Uh, this kind of connects also to what's going on in Europe and in the US. In Europe, we uh, seem to have control of the pandemic during the summer. And then after the summer, it has just gone completely crazy. So in uh, France, in Spain, in Italy, Germany, there are Belgium, there are no UK as well. They are no closing down the countries completely. So they are going towards a full shutdown again. And that's to mitigate this uh, exponential uh, uh, growth in the number of cases. And if you look at the cumulative number of deaths in Europe and the US, you also see that in Europe we have this uh, corresponding ex exponential growth here. Uh, it doesn't look as severe as in the cases, but we have to wait for another two weeks to get the effect of the latest cases here. There is a delay in from you are infected till you actually die. So my prediction based on the cases is that this curve will continue exponentially and become even steeper in the next two weeks. In the US, it, it's a bit more complex because there are have been different interventions in different states at different times. So it's it's a bit more chaotic, and uh, but it seems to have had a more rapid growth in the number of cases or continuous growth in the number of cases that you were not able to stop the pandemic completely like we did in Europe before it took off again. Okay, um, let's talk about ensemble data simulation. Ensemble data simulation uh, are methods now being used operationally in weather forecasting. This is a picture I took from ECMWF, that's the European Center of, uh, for Better Forecasting in the UK. And it kind of illustrates how you are using an ensemble of numerical prediction models to predict the weather. And you have a data assimilation window, which is here from nine in the morning till nine in the evening. So it's a 12 hour window. And these realizations of the model spends out an uncertainty in the current estimate of the weather here and also the estimate in the prediction. What you see here is that when you in, make a forecast over these 12 hours, you are not able to fit observations very well. So what you do then is to use these observations to update your initial conditions at the beginning of the time window. So you get a new ensemble with lower uncertainty that better fits the data. Okay. And then you continue the integration to make a new prediction for the next 12 hours. And then you will collect new measurements and you repeat this exercise. And the reason I show you this is that it's, 
well, this is something we call, at least I call it indirect uh, updates, because you actually, you have, you have come to this point in time, but you don't update the model at this point, you update 12 hours in advance, okay? So, and then you run the model again to fit, to get the solution that fits the data. And then you run the prediction. So that's kind of an indirect update. And this is exactly the same as we would do in, uh, in parameter estimation. So suppose you have uh, a system or a model with some uncertain inputs. So here we start with, uh, yeah, these inputs could be any parameter to the model. In an oil reservoir, it would typically be the rock properties, the porosities, permeabilities, etc. And the model process will be running the simulations and then you you generate uh, the outputs of the model, which which are the predicted uh, production, etc. In the epidemic model, then this uh, this input would be uh, parameters going into the epidemic model, the different time scales, uh, the R number, etc. You run it and you get predicted uh, estimates of the number of deaths, the number of cases, hospitalizations, etc. And you compare these with measurements. And then you try to use this information to update uh, your model parameters and you can run the model again and you now have a lower uncertainty and a better fit to the data. And this is again exactly the same process as you use in the atmospheric models in weather forecasting. You have the ensemble of input initial conditions, you run the model, you have a prediction, you have some measurements and you update these inputs again. So that means we can use the same methods as we use in weather prediction and, and also for up parameter estimation of uh, petroleum models to, uh, to calibrate the models in, used for uh, epidemic predictions. And to explain how these model or these ensemble methods are working, uh, I'm going to show you this slide here first. So what we have here is an ensemble of prior estimates of uh, parameter. And now I make a very simple case where I make a prediction from each parameter. I get a predicted measurement. It's a model prediction that I observe. And I do this for all the parameters. So now I have an ensemble prediction. And we see here that we are not really fitting the data very well. But the other thing we observe here is that it seems like there is a, some kind of connection between the prior and the prediction. So if we increase the value of the parameter, we also increase the value of the prediction. So in this case, maybe we can just increase these input parameters to get a better fit to the data. And that's exactly what we do. And the way we compute these updates is, is by using statistical regressions or and we, we compute the ensemble correlations between the predicted measurements and the prior parameters. And then we can compute exactly how much we have to update this parameter to get a solution that better matches the, the measurement. And we can do this completely consistent, statistically consistently. And uh, yeah, uh, of course, in this case, it's really simple because there's only one parameter and one measurement. But the ensemble methods can handle thousands or millions of parameters together with say millions of measurements, some parameters are being increased in value, others are being decreased, some are not updated at all, some might be correlated, some are uncorrelated, etc. And in that case, the whole problem becomes mathematically extremely complex, and it kind of warrants the 25 years of research going into these methods to get where we are today. And to show some of the mathematics, uh, this is for the sequential data simulation. So what I have here is a solution at time i. Uh, so this, the x is just the model state then. I have a nonlinear model, I make a prediction. This prediction I measure. So that means when you, if you predict the temperature on a global, in a global model, for example, you measure at certain locations. So this h will extract the temperature at the measurement location. So y corresponds to the measurements. And that means you can write y is a nonlinear function of these inputs, and we have measurements related to y. And if you write, sorry, I always do this. 
And if you write out Bayes' theorem for this problem, you can say that a posterior PDF of for x, y, and the predicted measurement, given the measurements, is proportional to the prior of your parameters, the model integration, and then the likelihood function. And solving this problem is what we call this indirect update or the smoother update step in sequential data simulation. If you look at the parameter estimation problem, it's again exactly the same. You have input parameters, you have a nonlinear model, and you have predicted measurements. And you write exactly the same Bayesian formulation. So this is now the standard Bayesian inverse problem for solving the solving for the parameters. And of course, here you're solving for x and y. And uh, what you would like to do is to solve for only x. So if you write your model as a perfect model, that means the prediction is given by t of x. Then you can write this delta function and you can integrate out y. And then you get the marginal uh, posterior PDF for x given the data is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. And this is really the problem we are trying to solve in uh, ensemble data simulation. Okay, so if you look at these, this uh, expression again, um, what we are doing is that we are sampling some prior distribution for our parameters x, as this red PDF here. We are integrating the model forwarding time, so we get a prediction PDF, which is this red curve here. And because the model is nonlinear, this PDF is non-Gaussian. Then we combine it with the likelihood function, which is normally Gaussian. And using these two, we are able to update or compute for the posterior PDF. This is f of x given d, which is this one, the black one here. And this one is, is not Gaussian. It looks Gaussian, but you see it's not entirely symmetrical about zero. Uh, and then when we have this one, we can just integrate the model forwarding time to get the prediction PDF. So this is what we are, will try to do. And we will use ensemble methods for solving that. And that ensemble methods will then be a kind of Monte Carlo representation of these PDFs. So we sample many realizations from the prior PDF, we integrate the ensemble forward in time, and then we update the ensemble realizations individually to get the updated estimate. And the rationale for doing this is explained here. So if we start with our Bayesian formulation again, uh, then it's possible to approximately sample the posterior PDF here by minimizing an ensemble of cost functions. And these cost functions, if you use Gaussian priors for the likelihood and for the prior uh, parameters, is a quadratic cost function. So you have the covariance, it's uh, normalized by the covariance of the data and the prior variables here. And we can create an ensemble of such cost functions. So that means we have an ensemble of prior values. So these are the values or the samples uh, sampled from f of x here. And we have the measurements, and the measurements are also sampled from this likelihood. And if we can minimize this ensemble of cost functions, then the resulting solution will be an approximate sampling of this posterior PDF. In the linear case, it will be an exact sampling. And we are using uh, basically three methods for doing this. One is uh, a direct solver, which we call ensemble smoother. Uh, then we are using iterative ensemble smoothers. And there is a specific method, uh, which I'll come back to, which is called ensemble smoother with multiple data simulation, ESMDA. And this last one is actually the one we used for the uh, epidemic model. To minimize this one, we, the first thing we would do is just to compute a gradient. And uh, the gradient looks like this. And we see that if we could uh, uh, compute this term here, we would be able, or yeah, then we would be able to solve this equation. 
So what we do is to represent this term by a Taylor expansion or a linearization. So it's uh, expanded around the prior value of f. And that means this equation is valid for small updates when the difference between the solution and the prior value is small, right? And then we have a closed solution of the system. Uh, so this is the major approximation applied. Uh, another simplification we do or make is that we replace these uh, derivatives of the tangent linear operators of the, the model equations or the adjoints of the model equations, if you like, with uh, a constant g, which is defined by uh, this linear linear regression uh, formulation. So it's a uh, so it's the so-called uh, least squares fit uh, over the ensemble. And by doing this, we are using a statistical representation of of this g here. That, uh, and that simplifies the equations quite a lot. And by doing that, we introduce these covariances. So, sorry. So we we get a system that's uh, directly solvable, and we solve it by sampling first the prior ensemble of uh, the parameters. We sample the measurements. We make a model prediction for each of the ensemble realizations. Then we compute the update updated ensemble. So this is, uh, is then used a linear update. And we run the model again to get the update for the predicted measurements or the predictions. Um, the problem with this method is that uh, this linearization is too severe in most cases, at least when you have strong linearities. So you have to do something more. And what we do then is to uh, go back to the same cost function, and we can again compute a gradient and a Hessian, and then we use an iterative method to minimize this one. And uh, here it's just written as a Gauss-Newton iteration. So you have the gradient normalized by the Hessian and a step size. So if you compute this iteration, then you don't have to uh, or make a linearization of this term. So you avoid that particular approximation. Still, we will, will uh, replace this gj by uh, the linear regression expression here. So we make a smaller, smaller approximation, but uh, this has not the same severe impact as the linearization of the g of x. And uh, if you look at uh, just an example here, so we are minimizing an ensemble of cost functions and each cost function has a minimum, and the minimum value is the one we want to find. Uh, if you find those, then we sample the posterior, uh, approximately sample the posterior PDF. So if you compute the ensemble smooth update, which is just solving this gradient directly, you, see, you find solutions close to the minimum, but not exactly at the minimum. So this is the prior, and you end up here. The prior for the black one is up here somewhere, and you find this solution. With the iterative method, you, within a few iteration, iterations, end up very close to the global minimum. Okay. And then the, the last method we are, we are using is this ESMDA. And what that is doing is to gradually introduce the measurements. And it's doing that by, so you, you start again with the prior, and then you want to make small, multiple small updates where we introduce the effect of the measurements. And the way you do that is to rewrite the likelihood as uh, the likelihood to a power one. So if this sum is equal to one, then we don't change anything. And so you have these uh, factors or coefficients alpha now. You say the sum of these are, is equal to one. And then you can write this as a product of likelihood functions. And that means you can solve this problem using only the sorry, only the, uh, the the likelihood to the power of one over alpha one first, multiplied with the prior. Then the solution of this one becomes the prior for the next one. So that means you are making a number of steps and and then gradually introduce the measurements. In each step, you are then assimilating inflated uh, observations. So you increase the, their errors. And 
we can show that uh, there are no approximations introduced here for the linear case. This solution is exactly the same as you will get in the ensemble smoother case. Okay, so that is uh, what I will say about the mathematics of the assimilation methods. Um, the important thing is that you try to minimize this ensemble of cost functions and you end up with a number of solutions that then approximately samples this Bayesian formulation. Okay, um, then we move on to uh, the epidemic model. So the first thing we realized is was that the measurements we had access to were the hospitalized, uh, the number of hospitalized, sometimes within different age groups and uh, with, with additional information, the number of uh, intubated, etc. But at least we knew uh, for all the countries where we run the system, we knew the number of hospitalized uh, patients. We also knew the number of deaths. And we realized that some people died in hospitals and a number of people died at home or in care homes. They were not hospitalized. Uh, and then we had some information about the number of cases, and that's where basically the number of positive tests. And these were highly underreported. And also we noticed that uh, in very many cases, only a small sample of the population was uh, tested. And uh, typically only those with uh, symptoms that worked in the, in the health services, etc., were tested, at least initially, due to capacity problems. Okay, and then the standard SER model, SER means susceptible, exposed, uh, infectious, and recovered, does not include information about deaths and hospitalization. So we extended the model uh, to a system that looks like this. So again, we had a susceptible, exposed, uh, infectious, and then instead of recovered, we had additional groups of what we call quarantined. And these are the patients that are sick and they know they are sick. And then we have some with mild symptoms. We have some with severe symptoms and some with fatal symptoms. Those with mild symptoms uh, recover and there is no more problem with those. Those with severe symptoms end up in the hospital and then they recover. Those with fatal symptoms are either going to a hospital and then they die, or they are in a care home or at home or somewhere else and then they die. So what we measure, had measurements of was the number of hospitalized and the number of deaths. And then we wanted to control the whole model system based on using this information. Um, in the, and then in some cases, we also try to use the number of positive cases. But then we said that uh, only 10% of the real number of cases, for example, were, uh, were measured. So this was most, more used to, to kind of control the initial conditions of, or the initial growth of the model or, or uh, to get numbers that were kind of realistic in a way. Um, the other thing we did was that we added age classes to the model. So we model patients of different age as different groups. So, and we had 11 age groups uh, with uh, small children uh, in kindergartens, in schools, uh, and, and then every 10 years, uh, groups of, of 10, 10 years difference all the way till 105 years or something like that. And of course, this is because the fraction of the old people that get severely ill or die is much larger than the fraction of young people. And also we wanted to be able to model uh, different behaviors in different age groups. So that means we have, the, so and, and then we model the transitions between these different uh, groups given these time scales. Uh, and uh, we also try to estimate these time scales. Okay, the model equations are actually quite simple. It's, uh, they just model a flow of patients between groups through the system 
and you conserve the total number of people, etc. Um, and uh, the sum of the right hand side of this equation should be zero so that you don't lose any, uh, any anyone on the way. Um, and you solve this using, uh, it's just a system of ordinary differential equations. So you have uh, 33 equations here, and then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine equations in addition here. So 42 equations in total. Um, the validity of the model uh, is uh, is a bit tricky because we, I think today it uh, we need to use a more advanced model. At the initial stage of the pandemic, uh, I think this model was okay. We have used aggregated variables. That means we need a number of cases, uh, a number of deaths, numbers of hospitalizations that to have statistical significance, right? So you cannot model very small populations or a small number of uh, patients because then uh, there will be too much variability in the model or in the variables that we cannot uh, include in the model. Um, also, we neglect import of cases. So we had no interaction between countries, which I also think was okay during the lockdown because then the people were not allowed to travel. At least uh, in Europe, you were completely isolated. And uh, these CERT type models have been quite successfully used previously to model epidemics. And the model is quite simple. If you use more complex model, you have to involve a lot of additional parameters and you don't have more data to uh, calibrate them. Um, yeah, I'm not going to spend time on this, but uh, we assume that there are a number of constant model parameters, like these uh, fractions of uh, mild uh, case, uh, cases, uh, fraction of severe cases, fraction of fatal cases per age group. And uh, the, here we used numbers that were estimated based on lots of data at the time when we ran the models. Uh, what we realize is that these numbers have also changed a bit with time because uh, like initially the, there were lots of infection among, among the elderly people and it seems like the, the, at least the total number of uh, uh, the case fatality rate and the total number of hospitalizations uh, has decreased now. Maybe because now there, are, there is more spreading or more infections among young people who are less likely to develop severe disease. So the models, the parameter, parameters we try to estimate in the model are all the time scales uh, and the case fertility rates and the hospitalization rate. Additionally, we estimated the number, initial number of infectious and exposed uh, because we didn't really know that. And we, most importantly, we estimated the effective reproductive, reproductive number as a function of time. And uh, it's important, this is a function of time, and um, it's also the most critical parameter for the model, as I will show you soon. Uh, we did a bit more to model it uh, in more detail. We said that it's a matrix, so that means uh, we model we can model different infection rates among different age groups um, and so it's a matrix which is constant and then we have a time development that uh, is a function of how we behave basically and a function of the interventions and what's important and what we realized very quickly is that the behavior about two weeks ago, determines today's deaths and hospitalizations. And this is also is quite critical when we assess the ongoing pandemic, because what happens today is what's going to, going to determine the number of deaths and people in hospitals in two to three weeks' time from now. And even if the numbers today seem to be not too scary, we don't really know what happens unless we really test a lot of people. And if we realize, or if we test a lot of people and we see that uh, the number of infections are going up, 
then we know that within two or three weeks, this is going to hit us with the number of hospitalizations and deaths. So what we can do is that we can estimate ROT for the past, and then we can assume a value of ROT for the future. That means we can say something about ROT in the future, given how people we expect people to behave. And this is a function of uh, interventions uh, implemented by the government or uh, cultural differences, etc. Okay, so then just quickly, we used the uh, ESMDA method. It's simple because of its simple implementation and use. It's sufficient for large ensemble sizes. So we could run, in this case, we run 5,000 realizations. So there are basically no sampling errors here. And we used 32 uh, of these update steps to reduce the impact of nonlinearity. So we have a highly converged uh, solution. Uh, this is an example from the paper, and it was uh, from Norway. And in Norway, we, uh, yeah, you, you can see here that you get you got a really strong increase in the number of hospitalizations in in the mid from mid March till first of April, and then it declines again very quickly, and it seems to be uh, problem solved in a way, and. Uh, I did not. I, we, we did not run the model after, uh, say, mid July or so, and also the number of deaths increased rapidly in the beginning, and then it's starting to to kind of level off. And I sh in fact, today I think we have 280 deaths in Norway, so that's just here somewhere. And and then we estimated the R number. Uh, based on these measurements. And we saw that initially it was quite high. We were about 4.5 or so. And then we implement, we had a drop in the prior. So it went down, the prior is uh, 0.8 here and with uh, uncertainty. And then we see that in the model, we estimated R to become as low as maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3 uh, at the end of March. And this is really because in Norway, the country really shut down. People got scared, everything closed, everyone stayed inside, and uh, there were no interaction among people. We only went out uh, to go shopping and uh, that's it, or yeah, buy food. And that's maybe once or twice a week, and then everyone was really careful and you went at uh, times when there are almost no people in the stores, etc. And then we see that uh, during April, the value of R started increasing a bit again, because now we started relaxing some of the measures. I'll come back to that. We opened schools, et cetera, from, uh, from 20th of April, and uh, some people started going back to work, and restaurants started opening again. And then it stabilized for a long time, at least up to here, around 0.8. So we had a stable situation, in a way. And uh, yeah, this, is, this is just... Uh, a total number of active cases, and you see it's on a decline. And in the, yeah, in the summer, we were below 1,000 active cases in Norway. Another thing with Norway is that we are again on the limit of validity of the model. You see, there's a lot of variability in the data that are that the model cannot capture in this case, and that's more statistical uh, fluctuations based on when people are dying and hospitalized, and etc. What we, one of the more important cases we ran was this one. This was run after one, I think it was run in mid, uh, mid April. Yes, because from the 20th of April, the government planned to reopen schools and kindergartens. And then we were asked to provide estimates of or scenarios of how that would impact the epidemics in Norway. And uh, again, we have the almost the same solution as in the previous case with a really low number. And then we run scenarios, uh, one scenario, which is a stable scenario where we assume that uh, we continue staying at 0.8 for the R number, one scenario where we increase R to one, and one where we increase it to 1.2. And th these are really small changes, right? It's, it's not uh, 
is not a big change in behavior among people from this scenario of 0.8 to 1.2. But the solutions are completely different. In the stable scenario, everything looks great. We uh, continue and uh, the number of hospitalized goes, to, goes towards zero. The number of uh, deaths are leveling off. In this scenario, we have a stable, it's a neutral case. So what you will see is that the number of hospitalizations starts becoming a constant value. And the same with uh, the deaths, number of deaths will have a linear increase. Oops, sorry. And then uh, in this final case, everything is unstable. And even with this just slight instability, within one month, we have a significant increase in the number of hospitalizations. And if you continue this integration, it, you would not like the, the results. So our advice to the government was that, uh, well, we actually advised against opening schools based on the risk of having an R above one. Uh, still, when you decide what to do, it's a judgment based on all kinds of other consequences, economic consequences, health issues, uh, how children are, uh, how their lives are at home, in good families, in poorer family, etc. So in, in the end, uh, we reopened schools and um, what happened was uh, really what we see in this previous plot, R stayed around 0.8 uh, until uh, mid-July or so. And uh, so that means that the, the behavior of the adult population or the rest of society was sufficient to mitigate the increase in R we got by opening schools. Okay. Um, I will show some other examples. Uh, this is uh, on how we model this R of T, the effective uh, reproductive number. And this is from the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, you have a lot more cases. So you, you have a log scale here, but you see that they have uh, like five, five, two, three, four, five, uh, three, two, two, three, four, five thousand uh, hospitalized, and the deaths are approaching 10,000, etc. And uh, what we did here is just running with different priors of R to see how stable the system is or how well you can recover the actual behavior in R. So in this case, you have, it's a bit like in Norway, you have a constant uh, prior and a discontinuity, a jump, and then it continues like this. And here you see that also in Holland, you had a strong reduction in the uh, end of March, beginning of April, and then it, uh, at least until end of May, it stayed quite stable. Um, this is another example where you have a wide prior on the uh, R value, but it's uh, the mean is equal to one all the time. And again, you get this strong increase initially and then a big drop and a kind of similar behavior uh, until, say, yeah, mid, mid April or mid May. And then, because of the larger uncertainty, you have more, in, more spread in the predictions. And then they also run one case where you have a continuous value of R. And uh, again, you get a very similar estimate. So we think that it seems like the system, independent on how you specify the prior of R, is able to recover quite good estimates of the R value for the past. So when you have uh, measurements. And then what's happening in the future is again, a, uh, consequence on, of how you behave. Um, this is a case for Argentina. That's actually the only case where we only had uh, death rates as data. And they were also able to model the development quite accurately. Uh, at end of uh, August, the predicted number of deaths is very similar to uh, the, the real observed number. So it's about uh, 10,000, uh, which is about here. So it's the middle scenario. So it turns out that they had uh, they estimated an R value that just went below one. And this is, of course, because in Argentina, they also had a really strong interventions initially. But then at some point, it's impossible to maintain that. 
or it was impossible in Argentina at least. And then this uh, middle scenario here is probably the most uh, realistic one. So with R equals 1.3. Um, in the US, uh, here we had some interesting uh, results. And what we see is that there is uh, a lot of variability in the hospitalizations and the deaths. So it's not uh, just pure exponential or linear trend as we, we saw in the European countries. And we are able to capture these, this variability and we see that in the R numbers again. So in Alabama, you have this peak here that gives a increase in the number of deaths and hospitalizations two weeks, two, three weeks later, and then a decrease again that we again find here. And uh, so that means that the fact that we are able to estimate this time uh, variability of the effective R number means that we can track the epidemics quite well uh, over time. Yeah, we see even more here in uh, for California. Okay, uh, I'll skip this. I think uh, time is running fast and uh, I have a quick summary. Uh, so we made a system that's able to track the epidemic quite accurately. We can estimate the effective R number in the past. We can use this system to quantify the impact of interventions by just assessing the experience we have so far with uh, where we see the effect of opening schools, etc., or opening up society. Uh, we can run short-term forecasts using our persistence, and that seems to work quite well for, say, two to three weeks into the future. We can run long-term scenario forecasting with specified future Rs, so we can assume, assuming different uh, policies for interventions, we can predict uh, how the disease will develop. Um, then I will refer to the code, which is on GitHub, and uh, there are quite a number of users now. Uh, and also the, the original manuscript is on MedArchive. The new version is not uploaded on MedArchive, but I hope it will be available in the, from the journal quite soon. And uh, then I can also say that uh, recently we have worked on uh, extending the model to include the multiple uh, communities or countries with uh, import or interaction with, between the communities. So we can model uh, import of infections. We can model all the states in the US or all the countries in Europe. In Europe. Okay, I think uh, I will stop there. And thank you, Dr. Evanson, for uh, your great talk. If there are any questions, don't hesitate to unmute yourself and ask them. And if you don't have a microphone, don't then just write, type them down in the chat and I will relate the questions to him. So thank you again for speaking while we're waiting for questions. Thanks. I want to quickly thank the speaker for coming. Thank you so much, uh, Gear. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks. So I have one quick question. So did uh, getting more data about COVID uh, helped improve the, the model itself or the model is pretty independent of the epidemic? No, it's, uh, that's a problem because uh, I think for the initial part of the epidemics, then it was okay to use constant values uh, for a lot of the parameters. If you look at how things are developing now, uh, so here we are. Yeah. Then uh, I think in the new version of the model, we have included time variability of the case fertility rate and hospitalization rate as well. So those are also functions of T, and that's uh, those. Those are things you have to take into account now when you see, because uh, well, people are treated better in hospitals or they receive better treatment. It's not quite to say. And uh, so less people are dying and, and we know more about the disease. So there are parameters that were constant initially that uh, we know have had to uh, make time dependent. 
Yeah, I don't know if that was an uh, answer to your question, but uh... yeah, that answered it pretty well. Thank you. Are there any other, <clears throat> sorry? Are there any other questions? So, do you do any modeling that that takes uh, spatial information into account? Um, uh, yeah, not in this particular version that I presented now. In the version we have uh, are currently developing, I said that we can have multiple countries, multiple cities, etc. So you, that means basically you run one model for each city and you say something about the interaction between them. Uh -huh. So that means you can start with one city without any infections and then you have some people coming from the neighboring city and uh, with a an introduced uh, virus right and then it starts growing so yeah mm -hmm. thanks any other questions Um, if uh, I, I will be happy to share the presentation and uh, also the latest version of the manuscript, if anyone is interested. So yeah, I would be interested to get the uh, last li the link that you had in your last slide, maybe by email, so that we can share it. Yeah. We upload upload the recording. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Seems like there's no question. It's about to strike the hour, so I guess we'll we'll just be finishing on time. Thank you again for the great talk. It was really instructive. Okay, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. Yep. And thank I you very much. Have a good remaining of the, uh, the, the day, and we're, we'll be looking forward to the updates on your project. Okay, thanks a lot.